squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders underdog wins are the lifeblood of sport. Much as Americans and Craig Doyle love to big up an incredible dynasty, the appeal of the whole concept is that anything can happen, anything can change, and anyone can win. And yet, in rugby, we've all been conditioned into following one basic rule. Underdog wins are the best. The best thing, unless, with the one condition, unless the underdog is England. Well, this weekend, Steve Borthwick's England, a side written off harder than probably any side wearing the rose ever has been in living memory, produced a performance for the ages against the defending champions and nailed on favourites for this year's Six Nations. A last gasp, Marcus Smith dropped goal, giving them the rewards on a day in which they were simply better than the best team in the world. And you know what? I say, this week, screw that basic unwritten rule, let's celebrate <laughs> England. Oh, I might choke before the end of this video. So, how did Angleterre tear it up? Did Ireland show genuine signs of vulnerability, or is this a one-off? And how far can those two teams go? During the first break week, I did a big old YouTube dump, a big, big dump, trying to dig into what exactly Andy Fowles' old captain was building, and perhaps the essence of it was thus. After a highly successful World Cup of targeting opposition weaknesses, England are looking to now build their own new strengths. And what we saw on Saturday was the perfect demonstration of that starting to come together. That game plan starting to click in the way you could see it starting to eek towards doing over the previous weeks. I don't think any moment sums up what England did to Ireland this weekend better than this. Every team has a drill for what they do when momentum seizes up. If two or three phases in a row, you go nowhere, go backwards, or the ball is slow, consecutive phases. And whilst by this point, we all know Wales's drills for this very, very well, Ireland are much rarer, much harder to know, as they're so good at just maintaining quick ball. Their first fallback is to switch up the short passing and play off nine. Gibson Park or Murray selecting wider runners from groups setting around the ruck to try and catch defenses off guard, all these forwards setting flat, and then hitting a wider one, a random one, to get that front foot ball. Those longer passes, those missed balls straight off the base, making a more dominant shot from the defender much more difficult as they have no time to adjust from watching the ruck, watching the scrum off, to lining up their man. Their second fullback, however, in case playing off nine doesn't go to plan, has been, over the last two years, an unknown, unknown. It's probably at least a year since we saw this. And yet, after struggles at the line out here, Ireland throw it to the front, short ball, quick one, likely looking to recreate this one two switch with Sheehan from the other week. But England are totally alert to it. And after a brief Fred Astaire impression, Alex Mitchell pounces, six hours forwards, then getting sucked into the ruck in order to retain the ball, making it not only incredibly slow, but a very easy read next phase for Chesham, who flies up and smashes McCarthy behind the game line because there's only two options here to pass. To and McCarthy's very much the obvious one. Ireland keep holding the ball and Murray is finally back up to his feet, but these two phases have depleted Ireland of carrying options across the board and the ball is incredibly slow, meaning even the wide pass is obvious and numbered up. Theo Dan catches them behind the gay line, leaving Ireland in need of a plan C now, with no forwards able to reload on the open side in time. It goes to Crowley. Hitting the telegraph ball to our key here would leave Ireland almost 30 metres behind the initial gay line, so instead Crowley goes the all-or-nothing option, booting it up in the air. And whilst Keenan makes a great effort, England do win it back in the air superbly. By killing them over those first phases by denying them the fast ball, the front football, the big game line carries, England have kept Ireland from being able to use their attack at all, leaving Crowley with no option but to kick it away, even in a really promising attacking position, letting us see Ireland's plan C for the first time in, you're looking at at least a year probably. And whilst George Ford's subsequent clearance isn't great, as I discussed the other week, England's defence is so built on using every component, strong or small, to the best of their ability in useful ways, so they have Ford here make amends by just spooking our key, flying up to get in his game line, hoping to prompt an easy knock-on, which he does. Shortly afterwards, Ford takes it out wide, meaning there's less pressure on him directly, and makes a fantastic kick, leaving Ireland pushed back and with a decision to make. Keenan attempts a kick duel, but Ford isn't interested, so instead clears now under less pressure than previously, further up the field than previously, puts it out on the spot, pretty much from where Keenan cleared, allowing those troubles at the line out that I mentioned not too long ago to rear their head once again. Etoje here is making himself incredibly obvious, shouting, screaming, doing that thing with his mouth that he sometimes does, making Ireland so keen to avoid him, just don't throw it to that guy, that they completely ignore Chesham right here, who's just quietly, constantly watching, staring at Byrne, telling his teammate quietly to just dart to the back and lift him, allowing him to steal it in the air. 
The ball is shipped on to Earl, who then steps and breaks the line superbly, Ireland having rushed too quickly in the transition to try and flood the space, allowing an opening back against the grain. Clean line break, try to get an opportunity here, fast ball, pom, gunner, pom. Peter Armani goes for a glorious bit of cheating that sees Ireland suddenly down the captain for 10 minutes, having been put under pressure consistently by England ever since it was their own attacking threat. England, in the 22, go for the corner and run for a succession of faces that eventually end with Ben Earl himself scoring to put England in front. What we witnessed on Saturday was the England system Borthwick had been building starting to click. They're looking to build a team in total harmony, where the transition from one aspect of the game to the next is as seamless as turning the page. I could focus on the details. Alex Mitchell here, for example, being a carrying sniping threat adds a whole dimension close and allows England back up to the line here. And when the critical phase comes, with huge resources having hit Chesham to stop him crossing, just drag him down that inch short, England play it beautifully. Marcus Smith, just on the field, has flashed blindside, prompting Ireland to follow suit, watching the 10 set up. This leads the Irish forwards over folding, leaving a big gap back the way they came. Mitchell calls for Dan to fill it, and knowing he'll be needed to shut this down, Arky's eyes go to the hooker, yet Mitchell throws that ball Ireland themselves love so much. Bundy unable to adjust his vision in time, allowing Earl to skip on his outside and squeak over for the score. Yet those details are just a tiny part of the overall picture. Ben Earl's critical try is a masterclass in building an interlocking game plan. It begins with an Irish attack around the England 22. Yet, because the set piece has fed the defence, the defence can now feed the kicking, which feeds the set piece, which in turn feeds the attack, which feeds the other part of the attack, the forward base attack, which results in seven points and a yellow card for the opposition captain. It's perhaps why the first half against Italy and the second half against Scotland went so badly wrong. England's game plan is like a flowchart of ever-changing stages and merely disrupting the set piece or breaking their defence. Taking any one stage out of the flowchart can have a huge knock-on effect on the others. The whole system begins to fall apart. The garden starts to go to ruin. Yet, when it comes together, it's beautiful, unstoppable, brutal, and comes from an unlikely source of inspiration, that is Squarespace. Old school thinking always said that you build websites, blogs, storefronts, etc. separately, like an attack and a defence in the kicking game and a set piece, all being disparate parts of a whole that have to be constructed by different guys in different ways. And yet, Squarespace puts everything you need to make a beautiful, really nice website, literally all of it, in one place, one single zone, one single location, one single website. No need to install widgets or plugins or go to external sites to add extra features to download anything. Literally everything you need to make your incredible website is in Squarespace itself, is at that same link, and they all feed off each other. Your blog can integrate video, which can fit your shop and your social media tools, and it was only after witnessing this glory, probably quite recently, that Steve Borthwick's brain, I'm sure this is a fact, clicked into creating such an interlocking team, largely built off their aggressive new brilliant defence, which feeds their attack, which feeds their kicking, which feeds their set piece. And if you want to build your own world-class defence, you can try and buy Felix Jones out of his contract, but if you want to build a website instead of similar quality to Felix Jones' defence, you can head to Squarespace at the link in the description and use the offer code SQUIDRUGBY to save yourself some money on a brand new website, which is so much easier and so much actually probably more productive than having a defence if you're just one guy. If you like a small business, it's probably better to have a website uh, than to have a defence coach telling you how to do a blitz defence. England and Ireland are two very different teams, and perhaps instead of an interlocking arm wrestle, this game felt more like the two sides taking turns to do their style than the other one would take part. And this is perhaps best summed up by the first five minutes of the game and how each side receives and uses their first kickoff of the match. Where Ireland from the very kickoff plummet long onto a kicker, allowing Mitchell to just send it long, return very cleanly, granting Ireland an early attacking ball, an early attacking line out to run from a face play and all kind of Eddie Jones ploy. They get going, they get into it. Van der Fleer and Doris use pick and goes have clearly been designed, clearly a part of their game plan to circumnavigate England's aggressive defence. And the second of these two manages to draw a penalty, which Crowley slots over. Ford, on the other hand, gives it proper hang time, hanging it perfectly in the corner, allowing Feyu Aboso to make an initial contact before Chesham enters, attempting to rip the ball and drive Bundyaki back five metres, which is a very, very rare sight. And as Ireland look to play a phase in field to create a better angle, England really rush up. This is kind of a nothing phase. This could just be a simple kind of jog up slowly, but England put pressure on, on an almost pointless carry. Earl then gives everything trying to pressure low, and his kick is good, but slightly loose, not quite finding touch, and yet not beating Furbank either, who has positioned himself beautifully to hit the bounce at pace, able to run onto it, sprint onto it, and carry it in field. He arcs inwards, but the rest of the work has already been done. Ireland, regularly when relying on Lowe's 60-foot boot, leave the far side of the pitch broadly undefended. Two players, tops, 
watch half the field because they know the distance he gets on his kick usually means there's at most two opposition players back there, probably a fullback and then either a wing or a fly half. So only the two fastest chasers are really relevant. They've got to shut down those two. And beyond that, everyone else will catch up once they get there. The tackle has already been made if you can get those two into position. England, however, are fully aware Ireland do this and have set up as such. George Ford is in the backfield, allowing him to scan the defence and call the play as Furbank focuses on regathering the high ball itself. And the moment that bloody egg hits Lowe's boot, Ollie Lawrence here hairs it right out to the right wing. Ford, having read the field, calls for Furbank to work in field, allowing him to explode at full pelt rather than having to stop and scan and look for space himself. Ford's done that for him, allowing Furbank to fix Henshaw, the one real chaser. And when Freeman calls for the ball, Ford gets out of his way. Calvin Nash makes a critical fantastic read but not only does Freeman bounce him if we rewind time again to Lowe's kick England have left George Martin here a second row in the 10 channel meaning once the ball works wide he's perfectly in position to clear it instantly before any Irish forward who all sucked in around those two rucks on the far side previously positioned right out on the touchline can get there he's the first there by a country mile Ford reloads instantly and calls Furbank into his support I'm not going to pretend that Nash getting TK out isn't a part of this attack but I doubt he'd be in position anyway this hold and give by Ford is beautiful then. Too many players at all levels get tempted by the space and crab sideways to keep going, looking to engage Henshaw himself, make the meters themselves, try and engage the guy. But Ford knows how Ireland defend. The catch-up defender, this kind of guy who presses outwards on an overlap behind the main defence to make a scramble tackle, has become such a huge part of the game over the last five years since the Springboks kind of introduced it. And instead of old school thinking, Ford thinks 2020. He slows down and drifts inwards, squaring up, forcing Jameson to Gibson mark him, and using his body to block Burn from drifting as well, taking Ireland's two fail-safe options on line break opportunities out of the game instantly. He puts Furbank on a direct path to Henshaw Town, turning this into a very clean, old-school overlap. Furbank's hands are lovely, allowing Slade to fix Keenan and put Lawrence away down the wing. Gibson Park, nowhere near, largely thanks to Ford's 4D chess. One team's kickoff results in a slick, repeatable process, granting them three points. The other, a moment of rough and tumble that isn't repeatable, but nonetheless nets them five. That try, for me, perhaps encapsulates an awful lot of the current Steve Borthwick rebuild. It's not pre-scripted. England haven't gone into the game knowing in the first kickoff we're going to play right out to the touchline and perhaps try and create a line break opportunity, but they're prepared for every eventuality and George Ford is there in order to spot them and call which of those eventualities that they've prepared for looks most likely. Lawrence and Martin are in position just in case this comes and their forwards flying up to pressure Ireland on those previous phases create the chance, ultimately, for them to play wide later on. All of it feeds into the next section. Where in the World Cup they're a slick, cohesive team with game plans that made it hard for anyone to stand out. They're now building those strengths, the whole game plan calibrated carefully to what wild, brilliant things the team's individuals can create, such as the Faye Boso break on the short side for that final passage. However, Ireland aren't the number one team in the world for nothing. After being caught out on the opening exchange, they immediately adapted their kicking game, just as they had against France, to cancel out England's counter-attack strategy. When thumping long, now a key part of Ireland's game, they almost always aimed not for Furbank, not for a winger, but specifically for George Ford. Not only the slowest player likely to be back there, preventing the kind of pace that Lieutenant Furbank brought to that first attack cropping up, if George Ford is focused on catching the high ball himself, he isn't able to scan the defensive line and working out where Furbank, Faye, Raboso, et al. are best to set up an attack. This blunted England's counter-attack chances enormously and instantly, albeit with one exception proving the rule. Gibson Park here hits it brilliantly, placing it on Ford near the touchline, momentum almost causing Ford to stumble into touch, but he ships it in field to Furbank and they look to go wide. Yet Ford had no chance to call anything, so Furbank has to look up, scan, have a look, think about it before starting his attack. And when he does start, England are instantly met with a swarming Irish defence, the first two chasers making brilliant shots, yet England keep the ball alive, resulting in four players here making tackles immediately off kick chase. And it leaves them light. Both centres tied into that chase, Ty Fur Long has now found himself acting as Ireland's midfield, and frankly, he's done that before with remarkable results. Yet, England know they can target this. And whilst McCarthy makes a great effort to shut it down, Ford's inability to scan on first phase has left him in perfect position to set shape around on second phase. It's simple stuff. England have been using a 1-3-2-2 setup as the building blocks for Ford to work within, and he utilises them beautifully here. The free is a distraction for those two Irish forwards. Genji's dummy line holding Captain Potato, George hitting George, who, much like the Communist Party in 1947, takes a shot from McCarthy, and instead of going out the back to Slade, links the free to the two, allowing the two backs to wrap around the corner. Yes, Republican centre Joseph McCarthy 
if he did want to refuse to link up with Henry Slade. Probably due to commitment to Exeter Chiefs and he hated their chant or something. He wouldn't. He'd find Exeter Chiefs unpatriotic because they were a British team and they're celebrating like Americans. It's a whole thing. Probably a whole thing. Don't know. I don't know the details. I should have looked them up before recording this. This once again fixes Ireland's catch up defence. Ford sending Underhill square, blocking Furlong's effort and allowing him to ride the tackle of Gibson Park and offload to a Toge. The wrapped backs on hand and Furbank able to run it in using that pace Ireland were trying to prevent. So much of the talk post match has been about George Ford and Marcus Smith. Those missed kicks by Ford spreading some misconceptions that he played poorly or whatever, but he was fantastic, laying a platform and a set of expectations that allowed Marcus Smith to come on to emerge from the bench and cause chaos. Ireland no sooner settled into a game than facing a total shakeup from deep within Smith's quiff. So much of that final passage leading to Smith's drop goal was him, was him shaping things, him putting things on and him using the ball himself in a very different way to Ford, looking to engage defenders much more, looking to eat up that space in the way Ford was very square. This isn't a matter of either or, it's a matter of the two working beautifully together, complementing each other and allowing to change the picture for defence for an opposition without weakening them at all. The two are playing very different roles. Smith is working brilliantly, as the lad who was here before Steve Ball would put it, a finisher. Because that drop goal was required, because Ireland did settle into this game and did take control of it, completely against the grain as well. James Lowe's try is perhaps the crowning moment of Jack Crowley's impressive Six Nations so far, calling an initial shape to target the game line and a subsequent pod of forwards to create quicker and quicker ball in a tighter position. Crowley with just an instinctive knowledge that this will work best, trigger needs to be pulled after two phases. Hiding himself here then and forcing Faye with Bosa to jam in when he calls the ball and Gibson Park to fix Slade and put Lowe over in the corner. There'll be a temptation from an Irish perspective to read too much into this game, especially after sky-high expectations, seemingly everyone to ever pull on the green shirt in years gone by, piled onto this team in the week. This video thus far has focused almost entirely on England's role in this game, but I think that's with fair reason. Ireland are the number one team in the world because they're the most consistent team in the world, rather than because they're the most able because they've got the highest ceiling. Where New Zealand or France, for me, are capable of putting together a 10 out of 10 display where they could beat literally anyone by a higher margin. Their very best performance is better than Ireland's very best performance for me. Ireland are the only side who hit an 8 or 9 out of 10 every single week. And the facts of the matter are, right, what we learned this week. Sometimes other teams hit 9s or 10s that can beat Ireland and an eight. This wasn't an underperformance, this wasn't a bad game by Ireland. He'd be going back three years for the last time they put in a poor performance, just sometimes, just as in the quarterfinal, these days come up. Ireland were extremely good in the face of an England side doing a better job disrupting them than anyone else, maybe than over the Springboks in the World Cup, in recent memory, and yet they still managed to swing points and get ahead repeatedly. Here in the first half, unable to get their attack going as usual, England having done a brilliant job in defence, Ireland lent into their kicking game to get themselves back in it. This from Gibson Park is lovely. Furbank takes the kick but has nowhere to go and it allows the Irish defence time to set, with England still getting into position. In England's usual 1-3-2-2, system, Chesham here should be partnered by likely a Toje or Martin, but certainly someone, certainly another forward, but having come from a series of breakdowns over on the far side to now, so on this side, Toje has been sucked in, Martin was sucked in previously, and it leaves England a player light, and ultimately Chesham isolated. Arky able to squeeze in and win the penalty, which Crowley impressively, brilliantly bangs over to put Ireland in the lead after barely getting anything going. If anything, games like this are incredibly reassuring because it shows that Ireland, even when their plan A and B isn't working, can still keep themselves in situations where even up against a team putting in their best home performance in years, they're able to lead them at half time and be ahead as the clock strikes 80. One mistake in that final passage, and Ireland scraped home in this game. Over the last three seasons, Ireland have lost four games out of 30. It's hard to get over when it felt a grand slam was on the cards next week. And trust me, I, I do remember it's not that long ago since I was in this situation. But the lesson from this game, for me, wasn't anything drastic for the Greens to learn from, but rather signs that they're close to the final form already. I just need to remember that these days will come once, maybe twice a year, so long as they remain successful in this final form. Ireland are the best team in the world, or at least the joint first co-best with South Africa. But the thing that Jamie Heaslip and whoever else fancies piping up has to accept to remember is we aren't living in 2015 anymore. Nobody in Test Rugby is these days that far ahead of the teams below them or behind the sides above them. England always had this performance in them and there's quite a few Test teams who do as well. The standard and competition of international rugby has never been higher and underdog wins are becoming that little bit more common, chaseable, imaginable. Ireland remain the best team in the world. Nothing has changed. They didn't have an off day. They just need to remember 
sometimes to watch their backs. Because England or otherwise, the lifeblood of our game is becoming that little bit thicker. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. This has been a bit of a nightmare to do. The video got wiped. Half the video got wiped midway through. It's a whole thing, so it's taken much longer than we expected it to. But it's ongoing, and we have more coming. A preview of the Super Saturday, which is this weekend. Hopefully with you very soon. We recorded a pretty lot of that, didn't we? Yeah, we There's went a lot over of all three games. We'll look at them. That will hopefully be with you on um, this, this YouTube that you've got on your device of your choosing um soon and um another be, thing yeah there's also a thing on bloody italy beating scotland that's being edited right there um oh how italy did it what they did what was good what was rugby what was not rugby most importantly oh, and Eddie what Jones. scotland did or didn't do uh, you're doing that. You're doing a voice on that. Um, I don't know. I'll and leave that for viewers to figure out. Then there'll be more coming in the week. There's uh, the podcast as well. We looked at... Scotland versus Scotland Argentina. Versus Argentina. Argentina. Um, so there's lots of misery for Scotland this week. We're on Otherwise... the semi-finals soon, are we? Yeah. The no, one more quarter final. One more quarter, one more quarter, quarter final. final. Fiji, South Africa. Um, loads more going on. Otherwise, we'll see you very soon for From the more oh. preview, which will be contained. Which will be contained. Be contained. Rugby. <laughs> I love watching rugby in a pub. <laughs>